I'm pleased to welcome Gary Wills to Politics and Prose. Wills is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and the author of several New York Times bestsellers, including, but definitely not limited to, What Jesus Meant, Papal Sin, Why I Am a Catholic, and Why Priests. In his latest book, What the Quran Meant and Why It Matters, Wills, a non-Muslim with an open mind, embarks on an in-depth reading and timely analysis of the Quran, the central religious text of Islam. In a time when many Americans make judgments about what they think is in the Quran, Wills examines the text thoroughly and thoughtfully, debunking several myths and reminding us that no one can judge a text that they haven't read. However, Wills is interested in more than the what of the Quran, he also wants to know why. Why, for instance, Muslims and non-Muslims alike find it such an inspiring book and why it can be difficult to interpret much in the same way the Old Testament and the New Testaments can be difficult to parse. Publishers Weekly declares what the Quran meant to be a work of intimate and charitable interreligious dialogue, and the New York Times Book Review describes Wills as not only one of the country's most distinguished intellectuals, but also one of its most provocative, bringing his learning to bear on great questions of history and contemporary politics. And on that note, please join me in welcoming Gary Wills. I've been on many book tours, and whenever I get a list of places I'm going to from the publisher, I'm always happy to see politics and prose <laughs> on it, because I know there will be intelligent questions and discussions. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a little experiment. Uh, how many of you have read the Quran? Good for you, that's more than most. <laughs> uh, let me ask the people who have read it, what did you think about the passage about the 72 virgins that are waiting <laughs> martyrs? Anybody find that there? What did you think about uh, martyrs who are in engaged in terrorist act being especially favored in heaven? Did you find anything there about that? In fact, did you find anything in there about holy war? Uh, there are all kinds of things that a lot of people think are in the Quran, and they're not. And I was surprised by many things that were not there, and by more things that are there. And I was ashamed that I had not read it until after 9-11. Then a group of academic friends were together and we asked each other, have you read the Quran? And none of us had. And a friend said to me, Gary, you haven't read it? You're, you've been a student of religion, I thought. And it was a truly embarrassing moment. So I went off immediately planning to read the Quran. And as I say, there were many things that were surprising. Uh, for instance, before I read it, would I have known what is the Muslim creed dictated by Allah? Let me know whether you think it's surprising. Allah tells Muhammad the creed he should live by. It is this, we believe in God, and in what was sent down to us, and what was sent down to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and what was given to Moses, Jesus, and all the prophets by their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and we devote ourselves to him. Now, that's not quite the creed that President Trump thinks is being preached in the Quran. In the, 19, in the 2016 election, he said, Islam hates us. And the next time he was on TV, that was on Anderson Cooper's show, the next time he was on TV, they, he was asked, 
do you really think that? Do you, do you want to modify that or qualify it in any way? And he said, no. There's a whole lot of hate there. Uh, if there's a whole lot of hate in Islam, we have to be very afraid. After all, Islam makes up 23% of the world's population, second only to Christianity. A billion and a half Muslims and two billion Christians, and the gap in numbers is narrowing. By 2015, they'll be equal, according to most projections. And if that's the case, how do you cope with hatred coming from all those places and all those people in all those countries? The, uh, the Gallup organization did one of its most expensive and extensive surveys of world believers in Islam and asked, how many of you approve of the attack on the Twin Towers in America? You know how many approved? 7%. 93% did not. That was a very careful, expensive poll, and the pollsters worked it out and published a book on it. Now, other polls don't have as spectacular a finding. In England, it was uh, something like 88%, not 23. And in other countries, it was small, ac according to how many Muslims were there and how much their uh, state accepted them. But in every country, a majority disapproved. So how can you call uh, the, the attack uh, an expression of Islam, which is, of course is what Trump was saying. And many other people tell us that we should take that as typical of the whole of the spiritual uh, religion of Islam. William Buckley, for instance, found, when he found out that people were going to educate children in a little book on the Quran, which wasn't the Quran, it was about the Quran, wrote a column saying, we cannot allow children to read the Quran. Uh, it wasn't even about reading the Quran, it was a discussion of the Quran. But anyway, uh, he said, because they'll grow up to do 9-11 attacks. The Quran is what instilled the teaching that these men acted out on 9-11. So they were not very good Muslims, after all. They drank alcohol and got lap dances before the, their day of uh, wrath. And most uh, Muslims not only condemned them, but said they were ignorant. They didn't know what the Quran says. The 72 virgins are not there. They're in one of the traditions, thousands of traditions, hadith, and a discredited one anyway. But we're not expected to know what Islam uh, teaches because so many people, like me, uh, immediately after the attack, have never read the Quran. And we really should because, as I say, it's, it's a surprising book. Uh, surprising in what isn't there that we're told is there, and what is there what we never normally would suspect. For instance, that creed that I read. Why is he saying we, that Muslims should say, we believe in the pro 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 prophetic writings of Moses and of Jesus. Well, one of the first things that surprised me is that the Quran is more inclusive than either the Torah or the New Testament. The Torah, in its uh, strongest teaching, says that there is a chosen people of the circumcised. 
the Christians and their strongest preaching, though it's all argued now, is that there's a chosen people of the baptized. But the chosen people for Allah are all monotheists. The only people who are excluded are the polytheists, which he calls normally idolaters. That is, the worshipers of the different gods that you have statues of. Everyone else has the understanding that God is especially set up for all believers in him. And when we're told things like Islam hates the infidels, infidel is not a word that he uses, that the Quran normally uses. Uh, for one thing, if we said that, if we say that today, we might mean by infidels, atheists, uh, secularists, etc. They were not in the purview of the seventh century. There were no atheists in the seventh century, believe me, anywhere. Uh, even the most enlightened Greeks, even Aristotle, even Plato, uh, said that, oh, of course there are a lot of gods around. We have to pay attention to them, though the highest good uh, for Aristotle was the unmoved mover, and the highest good for Plato was the unchanging good. But they all went through their prayers uh, to the local gods. That's what Muhammad was told we can't do. Uh, and that's because the central worship place in Mecca was the Kaaba, uh, as it is today. The great pilgrimages to Mecca are to proceed around the Kaaba. And it was part of the lasting covenant that God struck up with the people. And it was built originally and then rebuilt by Abraham. And when the uh, prophet Muhammad uh, went to the Kaaba, he found that there were statues of gods there, of other gods than the true God that was to whom the building was dedicated. Uh, Mecca is uh, an oasis in a desert, and it's an entrepot spot for the exchange of goods by caravan. Uh, Muhammad married a woman who was a rich manager of caravans. And when these people from various parts came in, they put up their own idols there. Uh, and when Muhammad preached only one god, he was driven out by his own tribe, uh, interestingly. And when the uh, people from Mecca attacked Medina, for the first time, he said, you can have war, but only defensive war. Uh, so the, the uh, idea that you, you begin, I suppose now historians say monotheism is the end product of a lot of polytheism when people start working out the difficulties in that. That is, if gods fight each other, uh, who's going to win? And mu there must be a superior god. There's still a god. Uh, and it's only later on that, according to the secular view, that monotheism becomes uh, powerful. Muhammad found out from Allah that there was always uh, monotheism, and it was a departure into these idolatries that was wrong with the world. So when you read about all of the prophets, they begin with Adam. Adam falls in the Quran, just as he does in the Old Testament and New, and uh, is condemned to bring forth children with original sin bequeathed by him. That's not in the Quran. There's no original sin in the Quran. There is sin, but when Adam repents, uh, God says, I'm always merciful. And so you are accepted back into the fold of the monotheists. And he becomes the first prophet. 
And all through history, the law says, I'm always sending prophets. Uh, they're always my messengers, and I'm always talking to them. Uh, so when one prophet comes along and it's different from the others, we're supposed to say, we have a different covenant than you, but it's still a covenant with the one God. There's only one. So Allah says, as uh, the God of the Jewish people, I struck a covenant uh, in Hebrew uh, and was called Yahweh. When the Christians came along, I struck a covenant with them in Greek and called myself the, the father of Jesus. And when you are now here, I'm striking a covenant with you, Muhammad, and your followers, in Arabic. And I will be called Allah. But they're all names for the same thing, for me, uh, which is what that creed uh, said. And it's not an isolated text, by the way. There are several versions of that all the way through the Quran. Uh, so when we look at the history of prophecy, prophecy, of course, in those days didn't mean predicting the future. It meant proclaiming the Lord. Uh, we wonder why there are fights between the various religions. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, you don't have any reason to fight each other. You're worshiping me. Uh, you just have to tell each other that I'm the one you're worshiping. And it's true, I will have no God before me, as I said in the Hebrew covenant. Uh, but the only gods that, could, that pretend to be considered other than me are those of the idolaters. So the, the, uh, the whole world of Islam is more ecumenical than any other religion I, I have experienced. Uh, it's more uh, a matter of spirituality than of tribalism. And the whole point of the teaching is that we must worship the one God. And he not only says that all prophets are from me, but he says that the world is preaching me. It's the uh, ecologists should be extremely happy with the Quran. He says, everything I made preaches me. He says expressly, David and the mountain preached me. Uh, Solomon and the ants preached me. Uh, Solomon, all of the universe is worshiping me, and I want to remind you of that. Water worships me. You know, of course, in the Arabic desert, water was a very powerful symbol. Uh, and so he said, I sent you, I send you water as a great blessing so that you will recognize that it's preaching me. Uh, there are a number of places where uh, inanimate things talk. Uh, even when a sinner gets to hell, and there's more hell in the Quran than in, uh, in most places, uh, and the sinner says, oh, I didn't do that. His skin says, yes, you did. And he says, and the sinner says, why are you talking? And the skin says, because God gave me talk. He gives everybody talk. Uh, when Solomon calls a meeting of the birds, you know, St. Francis was said to preach to birds. In the Quran, birds preach to us. When Solomon calls together the birds, the hoopoe is, doesn't show up. And he says, where's the hoopoe? I'm going to really reprimand him. And then the hoopoe c comes flying in and says, uh, I found 
uh, a place where the queen in Sheba, the queen of Sheba, uh, w was uh, ruling, but she doesn't believe in you. And so Allah says, go back to her and deliver this message. So the hoopoe flies back and talks to the queen of Sheba, and she says, okay, I'll come believe in the one Lord. And he flies back and reports. Uh, now, I don't think that Donald Trump knows that story. It's hardly a hateful story. He doesn't even hate the Queen of Sheba for not believing in him. It feels that it must talk to him. So I'm not going to say that there are not imperfect, I wouldn't say imperfection, I would say flaws in the Quran uh, that are like the flaws in the Old Testament and New Testament. For instance, they all countenance slavery, all three of them. Uh, on the other hand, the Quran, more than most, says that the best way to earn God's favor is to free a slave. And he parcels out how many slaves you should free for this or that sin. Uh, and there are, he says, there are three things you can do to make up for a sin, fasting and prayer and freeing a slave. Uh, so that's a flaw in all three. We all now think, and we should. It's also misogynist, uh, as most seventh century and all centuries <laughs> are. <laughs> uh, it says, for instance, that uh, a woman's testimony is worth only half of a man's. It said, if you need witnesses to a contract, you should bring two men or three, wo uh, one man and two women. Uh, and they, they, there's an accumulated uh, worth in that. And he says, when you're leaving behind a bequest to your family, uh, the son should get twice as much as the woman. And then, of course, uh, it's a culture that accepted misogyny, uh, or rather, excuse me, multiple marriages, polygyny, uh, the same Guinea root, that is, many wives. Uh, how many? Normally four. Uh, usually you are allowed four wives uh, only on the proviso that you could uh, support them in a way that was dignified and would keep them in a status of uh, acceptance. Otherwise, you can't marry. And he said, the idea that you might marry because you wanted help in bringing up children or something like that, that's a very bad idea. He said, another of the things that you can do in order to repent of sin is to adopt orphans. But don't bring in extra wives to take care of them if you're not able to take care of them in the first place. The, there's great care throughout the whole book of orphans because, well, our, he thinks it's because Allah told him to it, to do it, but our secular world knows that he was an orphan. Muhammad was an orphan, so he, he really liked taking care of orphans. Uh, there's another difference between this kind of uh, pol poly polygyny uh, and that of, say, the Mormons or others, uh, it's that the dowry system, which our whole Western world uh, maintained until recently, was a matter of the father of the bride-to-be paying a, uh, a tribute to the bride's family. They went to her family, which sounds, of course, to us like selling a bride to a family. Uh, and that led to tremendous 
difficulties of people, fathers trying to raise enough money to sell it, or to, to dowry his children off uh, in a dignified way. And when he ran out of money, extra daughters had to be sent to the nunnery or uh, con continue to live in a very degraded uh, state. In the Quran, the dowry is paid from the, by the groom to the bride. And that dowry uh, is her property and can't be taken away from her, even by the husband. And if there's a divorce, she takes the dowry with her, which is a great inhibitor of the man wanting to divorce the woman. Uh-oh, there goes the, the dowry. Uh, yeah, another difference is that although uh, the male could have uh, multiple wives, include up to four for most people, there was a special uh, exceptions made for Muhammad who, who acquired more than that in all kinds of ways that didn't involve sex uh, consummation. For instance, the the widows of his companions at a time when he was uh, very uh, revered, uh, he would marry some of those widows, even though he had no intention of having sexual intercourse with them, as a way of honoring them, honoring their former husbands. So the bride could also initiate divorce. She could leave him. Uh, it was always consensual on both sides. And it was easily dissolved, and it was easily resumed. Uh, he said, God loves you to have spouses. And if you break up, we, we'll try to, pre to prevent that. He, he recommended counseling to keep the marriage together. But if it falls apart, you can pick it up again. And so, uh, by contrast with the idea that you're going to get 72 virgins in heaven, and unlike the Christian view, in the Christian scripture, Jesus says there's not a giving of marriage uh, in heaven. There are, there's no marriage in heaven. They're all spiritual, and there's no uh, question of physical uh, connection. Well, in the gardens, which is the word for heaven in the Quran, your spouses are always married. The ones that you had and even the ones you resumed. Uh, but there's no, it's also an, an entirely spiritual realm. There's no intercourse anymore. There's no physical pleasure in heaven as opposed to the very common misconception of the uh, Quran. The, uh, the people you love on earth, you'll love in heaven, uh, your children, your other relatives, fathers and their children, uh, spouses and their spouses. Uh, so the world of heaven is the perfect oasis uh, that people are yearning for in the Arabian desert. It is a garden full of water. Water springs up at your feet. You know, in the, in the desert, you're uh, yearning for water is easily baffled, thwarted. You have to find the way to an oasis. And that, by the way, Sharia means way. It's only used one time in the Quran, and it's not legislative. He's, he's encouraging Muhammad at a time when he's feeling sad because people are rejecting his message. It's very like the pro prophets of the Old Testament that uh, the prophet says, they're going to kill me if I say that. And God says, go ahead and say it anyway. You're, you're supposed to deliver the message. Uh, well, that was true of Muhammad, too. And he was encouraging Muhammad. Uh, many of the times when he's talking to him, he's saying, keep at it. Uh, you've got to preach me no matter what. And he says at one point, you're on the right Sharia. You're heading 
uh, to the right goal. So keep, keep going. Uh, and that's why not only Sharia, but other words for path are constantly used. You've got to get on the path. Uh, that was uh, the language of the New Testament, especially in Luke, where the believers, you know, they, they were not known as Christians uh, in the first generation, and when it was used, it was used as an insult. Uh, they were brothers, sisters, uh, but mainly they were people of the way, heihodos in Greek. Uh, but even more than in those passages, the uh, Quran is always thinking of keep on the way, the, the true path, which meant the path to the next oasis. That was, knowing that was a key to life. If you didn't know it, you could wander in the desert and die. Uh, so it constantly talks of the way as a way to get to the final uh, oasis. And the oasis, you know, it, do it doesn't have many physical pleasures, uh, mainly spiritual pleasures of being happily united with those you agree with in your contemplation of God. Uh, but the, what the pleasures that you do have are, for instance, you can drink wine, you know. Uh, the Quran says you shouldn't drink wine, except in this or that circumstance. But he said, God will forgive you if you stop. He's always merciful. But when you get to heaven, you can drink wine because it's perfect wine. It's the kind that doesn't muddle your head. You can, drink, you can drink milk because it doesn't come from a cow anymore. It's just there. Uh, and figs will, dro will drop on you. You don't even have to work to pick them. Uh, and water will spring up at your feet. It doesn't come from clouds anymore. Uh, that's the, it's a kind of science fiction heaven. Uh, but very far from the kinds of physical pleasures that many people think of as uh, the essence of heaven in the Quran. So I found it hard to read the Quran at first. It's a very disjointed thing. It was dictated to Muhammad by Allah. And, and Muhammad was illiterate. He said, they'll believe that it's me talking because they know you can't write. <laughs> he says, you have to you have to dictate it to, to a friend or a follower. And they wrote them down, uh, the people he dictated to. All, all authorship was dictation then, by the way, as in the Old Testament, New Testament, anything of that time. Uh, and it was not until after he was dead that they put all these things that had been written down on the handy uh, surface uh, and organized it into a book and they didn't know how to organize it in any orderly way. So they just did the longer things first and the shorter things after. Uh, so it's a, when, when you try to read it with our expectations of logical structure uh, or sequence or anything of that sort, it doesn't make much, uh, it doesn't, it's not easy to follow. But once you start appreciating the kinds of things that are being said, it becomes uh, astonishing. And you begin to understand why Pope Francis says it's a spiritual document that Christians can learn devotion from. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Trump. It's not about hate. Thank you. Could you comment uh, at least briefly what 
ISIS misuse of the Quran and why it has been attracting individuals worldwide? Well, hundreds and hundreds of Muslim scholars have said the, the Quran has nothing to do with ISIS. ISIS is a corruption of the Quran as the Crusades were a corruption of the New Testament. Uh, the, the history of, the reason I went back to the original and just said, I, I'm talking about what the Quran meant, not about all of the other things that have been attributed to it, because that would of course have been, it's like saying, uh, if I'm gonna study Christianity, should I study just the New Testament or should I study all the things that Christians said were in the New Testament, which led them to wars and crusades and burnings of heretics and all of those things. Uh, they went through, the Muslims went through what we Christians did. Uh, they began as a persecuted sect. Then they began to get some social leverage and they became a more self-protective, and they fought. Uh, the Quran says only defensive war is just war. Augustine said the same thing. But then they got more power, and they became a, a super state. They became an, an empire, as Christianity did. And it got whole new structures of authority and the ability to punish. Uh, so w you end up going from the New Testament teaching on love and uh, forbearance to medieval popes with prisons and armies and crusades and burnings of heretics, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, if, if you're going to ask what Muslims believe, the question is not, they can believe all kinds of crazy things, as we, as we Christians can. But what are they supposed to believe according to, they all, uh, we cite back to the New Testament, uh, even in times of, of uh, imperialism. And we can't really condemn imperialism unless we say, wait a minute, that's not there. So we've got to be able to say the same thing about uh, ISIS. Uh, any of the things they do are not there. There's nothing in there about beheading. There's nothing in there about terror. Nothing in there about uh, raids or uh, destruction of unbelievers or anything of that sort. It's just not there. But how are we gonna say that if we haven't read it? So I say at the beginning, must we read the Quran? And I answer, we better. Yes. No. Thank you. A as with the Jewish and Christian scriptures, much depends on how you interpret the particular language of the text. And over time, many different schools, both in Judaism and Christianity, came to very different views. Perhaps you'd comment with respect to Islam. As you know, the four primary schools of law have very different interpretations, particularly in the degree of flexibility that you can have in interpreting the scriptures as opposed to taking them literally. And specifically, I'm asking in, as to ISIS, you talk about what I believe is the Hanbali school where the Saudi uh, primary schools of, of, of Wahhabism come from and how they get from the Quran that you've read to the justification for a very very, very rigid, um, strict society. Well, <coughs> there are not four schools. There are seven. There are four Sunni schools and three Shia schools. Uh, and they differ between the, all of them. <laughs> and, you know, it's like uh, scholasticism in the Middle Ages. There are tremendous <laughs> efforts to refine and define and, and carry on, on uh, split differences between uh, Franciscan schools and Dominican schools and Thomistic uh, 
stuff. Uh, I think the only thing you can do is say, we're not going to get into that because uh, it's not part of the original revelation. One of the most amazing things to me is that we've had dozens of United States states uh, that have passed or tried to pass anti-Sharia legislation. Now, what the hell is the Sharia they're condemning and how, how is it going to sneak it up upon us? Uh, is it one of the four Sunni uh, sh uh, Sharia laws or one of the three uh, Shia? Uh, and of course, they have no idea because they don't know anything about what they're condemning. What they're doing is saying, my God, they hate us. They're sneaking up on us. It's like our good anti-communist days. Or no, it was a, a communi communism was going to infiltrate into our government, our religion, our everything. There were communists under the bed. Well, now we've got <laughs> Muslims under the bed. Uh, so I deliberately didn't try to get into the things that were, you know, the ISIS, the state of Israel, of, uh, Islam that they're trying to restore is the imperial state, which was a, a big, grandiose empire. And by the way, it was a far more tolerant empire than the Christian empire when it was uh, in, in full power. Uh, Edward Gibbon is re really wonderful on that, that, that he said, people say that Islam is uh, oppressive he said, it was nothing next to Christian imperialism in the Middle Ages. Uh, so uh, I just accede to the, all of the Islamic scholars who said, ISIS is a, a strange aberration. And by the way, they also say they're ignorant of their own religion. Uh, in that big Gallup poll, it said, uh, 93% disapproved. They were, that was the Quran approving people. The 3% who didn't, the terrorists, didn't even know their own uh, religion. And then why were they acting that way? The, a lot of it was hatred and resentment against Western imperialism. You know, they wanted to hurt America or whatever country they are. Uh, having terrorist raids on uh, in the London raids, that kind, of, that kind of thing. They're not representatives of mainstream Islam. You know, the, the, the whole Trump attitude that we've got to <laughs> fear these people and keep them out, well, they're already in, you know. If you think that every, every Muslim in America hates us, there are lots of Muslim uh, policemen, soldiers, doctors. Uh, there are two congressmen who are Muslims. I don't think they hate us. They <laughs> went, the first one, when he was sworn in, went to the Library of Congress and said, could I borrow Jefferson's copy of the Quran? <laughs> <laughs> and, and was sworn in on that. Uh, so, uh, I don't think we have to fear the mainstream Islam, the spiritual Islam. We only have to fear these truly pe people who truly are hateful, hateful. And you might say, as lots of people do, uh, the whole anti-imperial uh, movement in various countries around the world, uh, you can see their point of view. They were deprived of their various freedoms by the imperial powers. See, one of the great things, one of the most important things that happened in the wake of World War II is that the, imperi the imperial powers had used these uh, colonies to fight for them. Uh, and as soon as the war was over, spokespersons for the various countries said, Oh, we're going to get rid of them. You know, we helped them out. 
when they needed us, but we don't have to be their servants anymore. And so the uh, anti-imperial movement grew up and went, as it was quashed in various countries, uh, the resentment of the, the empires became stronger and stronger. Uh, well, the whole uh, terrorist part of that story is part of that larger story. These are people that uh, were, in a way, heroes when they stood up to the uh, colonial power. And to the extent that we have not uh, dispelled their hatred of empire. For instance, <laughs> George Bush thought we were going to spread democracy by going into Iraq and knocking off Saddam Hussein because he was a dictator and everybody wants freedom, so they'll be happy to see us and they'll thank us. Uh, we'll be the liberators, etc. He had no idea that the problem in Iraq was that a Sunni government, a minority Sunni government, was ruling a Shia majority. So when we went there, we said, oh, well, we've got to get rid of Saddam and get rid of Saddamism, which was really Sunnism. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get rid of the uh, party, the Ba'ath party. We'll get rid of the army. We'll get rid of the Sunni army, Sunni-controlled army. And people at the time said to uh, the whole Bush administration, you know, when you knock off the Sunni people, they're the ones who've had position. They're the, they're the professionals. They were the army. They've got weapons. Uh, they're going to resent <laughs> very much what you're doing to them. And of course, they did. So the whole of the... Uh, tremendous reaction against us was religious, and we, d we didn't know anything about the religion then. Uh, again, George Bush <laughs> never read the Quran any more than Bill Buckley did or uh, uh, Trump. Uh, so I think the thing to do is to say, we can't sort out all of your differences any more than we can sort out all the uh, differences in canon law in the Middle Ages. But please pay attention to what you recite every Friday or Saturday or Sunday uh, and f go back to your spiritual roots. Um, sir, I've, I've read a lot of your books on Christianity and Catholicism and they're fantastic and I'm looking forward to reading this. But I have a question about sort of just the text because I've read a lot of like scholars of, Chris of the Old and New Testaments like Bart Ehrman and Elaine Pagels who dissect the text and show that words were changed in, in, with translations and copying over time. Like one of the examples is the idea of Mary was a virgin was a translation basically when Greek was translated into Latin. But are there such issues in, in, um, with the Quran? Um, and uh, I wonder if you could comment on, on, on yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Uh, the Quran, you know, Allah says, I've given you a Hebrew covenant and a G Greek covenant and now an Arabic covenant. And the idea that it is such a sacred text, as happens with many, is that uh, you really must adhere to uh, it in the original. So everybody, Muslims all uh, recite the Quran, many of them memorize it. It's an oral document. Uh, even the ones who are no longer Arabic speaking. Uh, so, and they're, the really strict school of uh, Islam says there should be no translation. Uh, that, that was an original uh, inhibitor of translating at all. Uh, but it's true that on certain matters, uh, you, you bring up a very good one about what it means in Isaiah about a, a young woman or a virgin conceives, but whether you, if you're talking only about the idea that uh, there's a virginal conception, 
uh, other than that, it's the general. There's not a. I went. I used a lot of translations. Alim's is the main one, but uh, many others. And there's a very good thing, the study Quran, a thousand page thing done recently and really helpful. But I'm talking about uh, general views of the religion, which are not all that different. For, for instance, we all, I think, talk about uh, Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible without knowing uh, all of those difficulties, without uh, knowing Hebrew or Greek or uh, Arabic. But the, the general uh, message is pretty clear. Uh, if you read it, you know, very minor difficulties can arise, but the major teaching is pretty clear. That's why we all talk so readily about them. And we don't pretend that we're scholars. I don't, sir, I say in the book, this is a Catholic looks at the Quran. And I say, we should have the same thing from Jews looking at the Quran, from uh, Protestants looking at the Quran. Uh, I think we'll mostly agree if we are only take the trouble to read the damn thing. Hi. Uh, I was just curious um, in, uh, about uh, the, what your opinion is of the class, clash of civilizations thesis that Samuel Huntington, uh, which, which, which uh, does have connection to, you know, the attitudes and uh, approaches, you know, to is Islam. And, and as a corollary, what do you think, uh, how effective do you think the interfaith mo uh, dialogue has been? Uh, my father wrote the God of Justice <laughs> uh, in the Quran. So, uh, you know, I come from a family that has been involved in this uh, controversy about Islam. And three, what do you think of the role of the, of the secularist in, w in the Muslim world and whether you think that they also had some influence in the way Islam was perceived by the, the West? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, there's always a clash of civilizations. Uh, that book was written to answer things like Francis Fukuyama's saying that secularism is going to take over the world, uh, and we won't need to bother about religion anymore. Uh, that was a more realistic view that these are habits and attitudes and beliefs that will not be melted down into one secular thing. Now, when you talk about secularism in the Jewish, in the Muslim world, uh, of course, if it's truly secularist, it's not in the Muslim world because uh, you have to be a believer in the one God to be a Muslim, according to the Quran. There are people, things that might, people might think are secularists. For instance, there's a thriving feminist body in the Islamic world, uh, but it's not secular. Uh, it believes in, the, in Allah. Uh, it just says there are things that in the Quran that are time-bound by cultural conditioning that we can change. We can build on, for instance, that whole thing about women as property owners. In the seventh century, that was a revolutionary thing. And it's been built on by dozens and dozens of feminist scholars. And it's interesting, we, I, I didn't get into the, the, the whole burqa, hijab uh, uh, controversy, but it's interesting that the feminists, some wear <laughs> the head covering and some don't. And from this pretty common motives, the ones who don't uh, say we're not bound by that development in our culture, and those who do say, I do it to protest people who think that you can't be a Muslim and uh, 
be a believer in modern values, demo democratic values, for instance. Uh, I, sh I, you know, I didn't talk about the whole clothing for women business because that's generally not in the Quran. It's true that the Quran says women should be modest and men should be modest. They should both, for instance, cover their private parts. They were against nudity and, you know, they wouldn't want nude beaches uh, of either sex. But uh, it said women should cover their shoulders uh, area. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of like St. Paul saying women should cover their heads in church. Uh, and it's part of the, the whole uh, adoption of identifying sim clothing symbols that you get in Jews who wear the armoca or Catholic priests who wear the Roman collar. Uh, but the idea that I, I've admitted that the, the text is misogynist and what wasn't uh, in the seventh century. But you know, the thing that they always say, uh, the critics, is that there's the veil verse uh, in scripture, in the, the Quran. But that's not about women's apparel at all. It says that when somebody wants to petition one of uh, Muhammad's wives, he should do it through a screen, through a veil, it's normally. But that's not what she's wearing. It's a matter of etiquette and traffic at the court of Muhammad. Naturally, when you have several wives and you want to get to Muhammad and make some plea, it's what normally happens. You go through parts of his court to get there. And he says, OK, you can petition my wives, uh, but you do it through a screen so that it's not face-to-face -face confrontation or solicitation or whatever. Uh, it's, and you, might, you wouldn't even know, perhaps, which wife you're talking to. Uh, it's a matter of order and uh, gravity at the court. Uh, so when various parts of the Islamic tradition wrap women up uh, <laughs> in varying degrees of uh, obfuscation, it makes me think of, I was taught by Dominican nuns, but wonderfully charitable and learned people uh, who helped me a lot. But when I was in grade school, my fellows and I couldn't tell whether our teachers had any hair <laughs> or any breasts or waists or buttocks. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't believe they ever went to the bathroom. Uh, but that's not in the New Testament. You know, that's not a, that's not a part of Christian essence. That's a part of uh, pu growing Puritanism in the uh, Catholic tradition. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you want to know, want to talk more about women, which is a wonderful thing because some of the best scholars of the Quran now are women. Uh, the last two chapters of my book are uh, all on its treatment of women. My daughter-in-law is from India and a Hindu, and I am not entirely comforted by texts about it's okay to kill idolaters. Do you find any softening among contemporary Muslims of the hostility towards Buddhism and Hinduism and the ancient religions of Asia? Yeah, well, the Quran doesn't know mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism exists any more than it knows uh, atheists do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a revelation to a circumscribed uh, part of the world, as was true of the Hebrew and the, the Christian revelations. So uh, I can't say that 
the Quran would be hostile to Buddhism or Hinduism because it doesn't say it. What about contemporary Muslims? Are you aware of any thinking, uh, rethinking? Oh, yeah, those? there are. Yeah. In a way, the logic of ecumenical mm -hmm. relations in the Quran opens up the possibilities of interfaith dialogue in a way that uh, would have been astonishing in the seventh century, but is a reasonable, uh, you know, Allah says, you have to be merciful and charitable to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only, you know, his opposition to idolatry is only a matter of casting out the statues in the Kaaba. But it's not something that you can attack uh, the idolaters. The Id idolaters have to attack you first if you're going to have any just war. Uh, the, you know, Again, if you take out two verses out of context, you can say, oh, this is a warlike uh, document which says go to war with the idolaters. It doesn't say that. The fight, some of the early fights took place around the Kaaba, the sacred place in Mecca. And in the caravans arrived, the caravans that came in, there was a tradition of peaceful uh, accord. And there were specific truces drawn up. And when those were violated by idolaters, if the Muslims were there and they were attacked, he says, can you fight back? He said, no, not there. In fact, in the, in the most famous, called the sword verse, though there's no sword in the text or anywhere in the Quran, as opposed to the New Testament, uh, he says, you can't break the truce even if they do. But he said, when the truce ends, the most famous verse says, after four months, because that was the terms of the truce, truce, then you can lie in wait for them and kill the ones who attacked you, but not non-combatants, not their uh, relatives. And if they plead for mercy, you have to give it to them. Uh, so in the two places that he's talking about that are in the holy areas around the Kaaba. And that's why it says, <laughs> one of the weird things is that it says he believes in holy war because he has to talk about the holy places in those two passages. But he was not waging holy war. He said war arose in the holy area. Uh, so all of these caricatures of Islam are so far from the Quran that it doesn't take great scholarship, it seems to me. It just means reading it. And most of the people who parrot these things haven't read it, obviously. When Bill Buckley said that uh, if you teach the Quran, they'll all become terrorists, he hadn't read it. <laughs>